Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dan Rundy. I hold the Schreier Chair at CSIS, and I also direct the Americas program. Thank you for joining us today uh, for a conversation on digital transformation in the Western Hemisphere, an aging population. Uh, before we formally begin, let's talk about logistics. So this event will last 90 minutes. Following panelists' remarks and a moderate discussion, we will field questions from the audience. The please submit questions by clicking on the Ask Live Questions button on the event webpage. Uh, today, we will have Spanish interpretation. At the bottom of your Zoom screen, please click the globe button and the, uh, that says interpretation and then select Spanish. Uh, please note that this live stream discussion will be recorded and made available on the event webpage 48 hours after this event. Anyways, good, very much good morning and good evening. Thank you for joining us uh, today for a conversation on, on what I think is one of the most interesting topics uh, in the world. I know there's lots of things going on in the world, but I also think we and I know there's lots of things to be worried about, but I, I think there's something else that's both a challenge and an opportunity that we need to pay attention to that doesn't get enough attention. And it's on this issue of an aging population in developing countries. In particular, we're gonna be talking about an aging population in the Western hemisphere and how we might address it through digital transformation. We published an interactive report on CSIS's website to talk about this very interesting issue. Uh, we couldn't have done it without the support of our friends at JICA. JICA is the Japanese aid agency. I consider JICA to be one of the greatest forces of good in the world. I consider Japan to be one of the greatest forces of good in the world. And I'm so proud that CSIS is partnering with JICA, partnered with JICA on this important topic. So over the last 50 years, the populations of most countries in Latin America and the Caribbean have actually been aging steadily. This isn't necessarily what you would think about when you think about Latin America and the Caribbean. There's a very large youth bulge, and there's a lot of young people in many places. But actually, the aging has happened steadily and quietly over the next 50 years, and that's going to continue. An increase in life expectancy coupled with a decline in birth rates is expected to continue in the coming decades. As of 2019, approximately 9% of the Western Hemisphere's population was over the age of 65, up from 6.8% just 10 years ago. So think about that. In 2019, it was 9% was over 65. In 2009, it was 6.8%. So the figure it, by 2050 is gonna reach 30% over 65 by the end of the, by the, uh, so 19%, so, excuse me, 19% by 2050. So 9% today, 2050, it'll be 19%. And in 2100, it'll be 30%. That's a huge, huge number. Fertility rates are declining. Additionally, there is a negative net migration in the region. That's, that's hard to con contemplate because there's been, we see migration flows in the Western hemisphere, but net overall, uh, there's a negative net migration in the region, at least let's call it before COVID, which has been a little bit of a disruptor. And as, as COVID calms down, I think we're gonna return to sort of this norm that I'm talking about. So especially of young people, this is also contributing to overall older population. As the aging populations increases substantially in the region, countries must find ways to support dignified lives of the elderly. We're going to have to strengthen social infrastructure, and we're going to have to prepare the workforce, a demographic shift. It means people are going to work longer, and it, there's going to need to think about what kind of safety nets we have, but also how to make cities and homes and lives more attractive and livable for the elderly. And elderly people, older people have a lot to contribute 
and are going to be an important part of our future. So we need to find a way to partner around this. And it's not just in the United States, but in all of the Western Hemisphere. Additionally, the COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated that Latin American populations, governments, and the private sector are underprepared for the digital aid. Not just in Latin America, but in the US and all over the world, the, the COVID-19 pandemic accelerated and exacerbated a digital divide for everybody. But a larger elderly population will bring with it rising healthcare needs, such as medicine, long-term care, additional kinds of resources like telemedicine and the internet and adaptive technologies. As the proportion of the elderly population in the region increases, so too will demands on healthcare services and demands for pensions, as well as the number of people at over time leaving the workforce. In reality, an increase in longevity is inherently a positive indicator for society. And even when combined with a falling birth rate, it's not a negative situation as long as countries are adequately prepared. As populations continue to age, we're going to need a digital transformation. And a digital transformation will play a critical role as countries prepare for this coming inevitable demographic shift. Digital solutions are a cornerstone of many initiatives aimed at enhancing digital technology and infrastructure. And they can play a significant role in supporting healthy aging by creating smart cities that encourage older populations to be active and participate in wider societal opportunities outside of retirement communities or nursing homes. While digital solutions can enhance life for many older adults, one significant barrier to these solutions is access. Another major challenge in digital transformation is ensuring that target populations are able to use digital solutions. So access and digital solutions. Partners in the region, like development agents, like the US, US government's development agencies, Japan and Europe, multilateral institutions like the IDV, important health agencies like the Pan American Health Organization and the private sector will all play a role and civil society will all play a role in developing and implementing digital solutions that su to support these shifting demographics in the Western hemisphere. Before we begin our conversation, I'm so pleased to welcome my new friend, Ms. Sachiko Emoto. She's a senior vice president of JICA. She leads JICA's operations in Latin America and the Caribbean, human and economic development, including JICA's partnership strategy. She has almost 30 years of experience in development and before assuming her role was the director of JICA's media and public relations department. Sachiko Emoto-san, thank you so much for being here. I welcome you. Please uh, make some remarks. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Don, for your kind introduction. First and foremost, I'd like to thank you uh, for this wonderful uh, partnership between CSIS and JICA. And to all the attendees joining us today, welcome to this event. CSIS and JICA have been collaborating for many years. Our latest research endeavor explores digital transformation within the context of Latin America's aging population, an emerging issue in the region. Let me start with the implications of population aging for development. Aging is now a global trend. The UN projects that the global population of people over the age of 65 will double in the next 30 years. But the speed of aging varies by country. Japan, for example, is aging faster than most Western countries. Similarly, many nations in South and Central America are expected to experience a very similar aging pattern to that of Japan. Population aging affects countries in a variety of ways. Not only does it influence social welfare and medical care, but it also impacts possible uh, public finance, labor markets and the industrial structure, urban design, the nature and sustainability of communities, gender and all the other areas. Population aging, therefore, must be taken into account in economic and social planning to holistically address development issues. In general, aging tends to be perceived as a negative trend for countries and their citizens. However, we should regard population aging as an opportunity to change the social structure, to accommodate 
people living longer rather than society as a risk. JICA, relying on the vast array of experiences accumulated by Japan to this date, remains committed to working with its partners in the LAC region to address the challenges stemming from population aging so that all generations can enjoy a healthier and happier life. In this context, today, I would like to share some example of what Japan has done to address population aging issues. Let me share two examples in particular. The first one is the introduction of the long-term care insurance in the year 2000. The new insurance sent a clear message to society. That is, the care for the elderly in Japan is no longer offered by the family alone, but by society as a whole. Notably, many of the providers of long-term care insurance are private entities. And thus, the introduction of long-term care insurance led to the creation of a large market, including a new market for welfare equipment, which in turn created many jobs. The second example I would like to share with you is the promotion of community-based integrated care in Japan. This is a concept of aging in place. It aims to enable people to live in familiar surroundings as long as possible, even after they developed physical disabilities or dementia as they age. Leading examples of such initiatives can be observed in various parts of Japan. It has proved that cities where the elderly can live actively are consequently cities where children and younger generations can live as well. This in turn contributes to regional revitalization. Nevertheless, Japan is experiencing a labor shortage to support long-term care insurance, as well as comprehensive community care. It's because not only the sheer number of young workforces is in decline, but also the industry's nature of difficult work conditions, as well as longer, lower wages of staff. I think this is where digital transformation and new technologies have the potential to be a solution to address these issues by creating alternatives for care services as well as by improving work efficiency. As I described, Japan also has issues to be tackled as well, and it is crucial that we learn from each other. Let me note that JICA has learned a lot from these and other experiences of Japan and has been providing training in Japan to personnel from partner countries in the field of aging. JICA has conducted cooperation projects on aging related issues, mainly in the ASEAN region for more than 10 years. And now JICA is implementing or formulating cooperation projects in Latin America in the aging population, including Mexico and Chile. As you are aware, the expansion of the internet and the development of new digital technologies, as well as the impact of COVID-19, have led to a rapid incorporation of ICT and digital transformation into all aspects of life in aging societies. JICA strongly recognizes that DX technology is the key to address development issues, especially in partnerships with the private sector, which is a leading force behind the development of new DX technologies. Against this backdrop, JICA starts working with IDB Lab to promote private sector-led innovations with digital and technological solutions to development challenges, including population aging. In JICA's view, promoting the use of new technologies among the elderly can further expand opportunities for all. In closing, 
I hope that this event will enrich us by providing new perspectives, as well as a renewed interest in supporting aging societies. Thank you very much for attending this and thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Emoto-san. Thank you so much. <clears throat> okay, so uh, our we have several really interesting panelists. Our first panelist is Dr. Pablo Ibaran, Principal Social Protection Specialist at the Inter-American Development Bank, the IADB. He has designed and coordinated evaluations on topics relating to social protection and labor markets, and he has advised project teams on evaluation of projects in health, citizen security, and urban development. Our second panelist is going to be uh, uh, Mr. Com Thomas Camber. He's an executive director and S senior vice president of Older Adult Technology Services, OATS. He's a leading expert on aging and technology and is regularly featured in national media. Under his leadership, OATS and Senior Planet have developed award-winning programs for older adults across America and now charitable affiliates of AARP. Our third panelist is Dr. Enrique Vega, Unit Chief Healthy Life Course at PAHO, the Pan American Health Organization. Dr. Enrique Vega is a medical doctor and a specialist in gerontology and geriatrics. Dr. Vega was part of the international core group that constructed and produced the draft of the United Nations Madrid International Plan of Action on Aging adopted by the Second World Assembly on Aging in Madrid in 2002 and then in 2006. Let's turn to our panel uh, to get started. Let me turn to you, Dr. Ibaran, to get some reflections about this conversation about aging and digital transformation in the Western Hemisphere. Let me turn to you first, Dr. Ibaran. Thank you very much, Daniel, for, for the invitation. And it's, it's it really an honor to be with, with all the panelists. And uh, I just want to mention some key points. Some of them were already uh, mentioned by, by uh, Shakito Imoto. And I, I also share with you our, our appreciation of JICA and the work they do. Uh, they are a very important partner in the bank and we work together in, in several countries. And actually something that we, we, we find is that in Latin America, I mean, as you mentioned, aging is has been taking place for a while. We're a young region, we're still a young region, but aging very fastly. And we have several uh, key development challenges that at some point that makes us lose focus from the real opportunity and challenge that aging presents to us. And in that sense, given that this is something that we know that for certain is going to happen in the next years, these projections that we have are really, really, really very, very certain in terms of the percentage of the population who will be a, a, over 60 or over 65 in 10 or 20 years. And that really represents a challenge, but also when we like to emphasize this an opportunity. Right now, the Inter-American Development Bank is governed by the Vision 2025, when we have uh, one of the, of the key issues, of the key, two key issues is economic recovery and social progress. And for both of these pillars, I think that aging and, and making the most of this process is really a, a very good opportunity. So one, one of the things that I think um, we really think is very important is to partner with entrepreneurs and, and developers of technology to try to solve some of these challenges that aging poses with the access to technology. Technology brings us closer. We need to increase access to healthcare, for example, for the aging population. And with the pandemic, we have seen how technology can help increase the access and quality of healthcare services. We saw that in the region, something that was done like in the middle of the emergency, but we need to work to creating the enabling environment so that technology can be applied in health in a more systematic and, and, and ongoing basis. And another important thing is that aging population doesn't mean that um, exiting the labor, force, the labor force as a necessity. People want and need to work longer lives. And here again, technology is a very important tool. We've seen even before the pandemic, some in interesting applications where people were able to, let's say like, like the, an Uber or, or services being provided by older persons through platforms 
that were really willing to continue doing some sort of work in a very different stage because, of course, they want to have different uh, access and different sort of engagement with the labor market, but that also helps them to, to continue working and participating in the labor force. So uh, I, I think it was mentioned, the IDB lab partnered with JICA to do a challenge in the silver economy. And the idea was there to, to create technological innovations or to support technological innovations in different areas of aging, because as you mentioned, this is a multi-sector challenge that talk, talks about housing, about transportation, about all the goods and services that older people want to demand and want to create. I think a very interesting approach that complements this perspective, for example, is the work done at the Age Lab at the MIT, right, to really have a very broad perspective about all the issues surrounding uh, around the, the issue of, of, of aging that, as you mentioned, is a very good news. It, it, it testifies the progress that the region is making. So we, we, with this uh, positive attitude, we need to identify those challenges and meet the opportunities. And I do see very concrete examples of how technology really can help us improve the quality of life, the services that we provide. It's not only the digital transformation of health services for the older people, but also of social services. Really, we, we, we need to galvanize the use of technology to help us be much more efficient because that is going to be the, the, the rule of the game in the coming years. Uh, sector uh, Public sector spending is going to be under a lot of pressure and we need to be very mindful of efficiency that, that we can achieve. And in that way, I think we, we, we can make good of having this very talented group of people that have all the experience and to have them in the labor market. That's why this perspective, and I, I, I'm sure um, Pajo is going to talk about the decade of the healthy aging, but we need to invest so that populations keep being uh, aging in a healthy way so that we can put on under control NCDs, long-term care needs. And, and 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 make this this happen and 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 just a final reflection i mean i i i very happy to to be able to to share this stage with jica because exactly latin america right now is discussing how to introduce long term care in societies and i think the experiences that we can learn from countries that have gone, done this relatively recently 20 years ago as he mentioned uh, ltc insurance was built it created a market, it created jobs, and this is a market building social uh, initiative that we need to bring forward. So mo the more we can learn in Latin America about this experience in Japan, I'm sure we have a lot of countries that are, are um, asking for technical assistance, for financing. We have an aging facility and we look forward to continue uh, this work. Uh, thank you very much, Stan. So Pablo, let me just have you for one more minute. Would you explain what is the silver economy? I think this was a concept coined by a Japanese thought leader or a Japanese economist, if I'm not mistaken. Or the, I think I've heard the term platinum economy in Japan. What is the silver economy? That's a very good question because it, 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 it hasn't been like a universal definition. What we see as a silver economy is all the goods and services surrounding the uh, population and 50 and over. And, and in some cases they use 65, but the idea is to understand that this is a transition and that the more we can, we can, we can invest in this population in terms of keeping them healthy, productive, engage in the labor market, then when they reach the 60s and their 70s, they will still be active. And they and we're redefining how and when uh, older population looks like. But in some cases, it's more narrow, like it, it only relates to health services or long-term care. But I think having a broader perspective of all the, 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 the silver economy and, and all the potential it has, it has its advantages as well. Phenomenal. This is very interesting. Mr. Camber, thanks for being here. I really appreciate this. Um, I, I do think a big part of respond, making this an opportunity requires technology and requires the digital transformation. I'm so grateful that you're here. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you, Daniel. And um, I'm also really grateful that Imoto-san is here from Japan. I've been to Japan to study a little bit of what they're doing with digital engagement and older adults. And there's a lot of really exciting uh, leadership being provided by Japan and also throughout Latin America. Uh, I've traveled down to Chile and to Colombia and to Brazil to see different kinds of 
models for helping people uh, that are older get on technology and use it to improve their lives. And I've learned so much from people in different countries. I'm really happy to be here to share a little bit about what we've been doing at, at OATS over the last uh, 18 years. Just a, a little a brief bit of context here. Uh, I'm the founder and executive director of this nonprofit organization based in New York City called Older Adults Technology Services. And I started OATS 18 years ago uh, because these two uh, revolutions are taking place the longevity revolution on the one side is the population is aging, and of course the digital transformation on the other side. And when I started OATS, oh, only about 25% of people over the age of 60 in the United States had ever used the internet. So there was a, a, a rapidly growing digital divide that primarily was affecting older adults. It also has multiple different dimensions because lower income people, of course, in general, have a hard time getting access to technology and being able to afford connectivity. Uh, it certainly is in the United States is, is something that's carried um, disproportionately by immigrants and people of color. And so um, all of these factors contribute, but age is the most common predictor of whether older people or whether people are online in the United States. And we started looking at this one challenge that uh, was really a, a part of the a puzzle that needed to be solved, which is the training and education of people in communities that needed to learn technology. Many older adults uh, find technology to be uh, anxiety producing. Um, they certainly didn't grow up with the technology when they were young. Uh, the, the term digital immigrant is very common in the United States to refer to people who had to learn technology as adults and uh, it was growing up all around them and they were forced to learn it for the workplace and to access services and programs. But many people never had a chance to be trained or supported as they got those, uh, they had to start adopting technology tools and in many cases simply sat on the sidelines. And so we started doing programs in the communities, training older people for free and how to use the internet and what was uh, Wi-Fi and what kinds of devices can they learn. And we began building centers around the country. We learned a couple of things that were really critical. One is that training is absolutely critical for older people and that it's not a one size fits all model. In fact, older adults are a very diverse population and it's really helpful to create training that is relevant to people's local or demographic uh, particularities or needs. And we were able to create programs that were designed for people that really helped them engage and get high quality experiences. Secondly, it was really important to build partnerships. In the United States, we obviously have a lot of resources to build technology infrastructure, but in fact, that infrastructure is not evenly distributed. And so older people in the United States often live in rural areas with very small communities, very small numbers of people around them, and they were disproportionately not on the internet. They needed extra help. And so we needed to build partnerships partnerships with libraries and small nonprofit organizations and even government agencies, both to get the training and the programs out, but also to be able to get funding and support from a variety of different environments and situations. Third, we learned that there is a challenge around learning technology for older people that has to do with ageism. Many older people are, are, are sort of pushed out of the mainstream of society. And in order to learn technology, there's an opportunity for us to recraft or reshape how we talk about aging. And uh, we've been working uh, on a, what we did is we branded our programs as Senior Planet and our centers are called Senior Planet. And the, the slogan is aging with attitude. And a lot of older people come in and they're having a really good experience with uh, aging and feeling more positive. And we found that that more positive orientation toward technology and aging is drawing older people into more of a community of users. And the last point I wanna make is that as we set up good programs that are working with people in the communities and partnerships that are sustaining, we've been able to grow to a national footprint across the United States. And we have recently partnered with AARP, which is the largest uh, membership organization in the United States. We're an, an affiliate with AARP now. Uh, and so we've been able to work with them to expand our programs to all 50 states. And AARP has a very strong research and advocacy component that's been able to help the federal government, the national government shape policy. And this last year for the first time ever, in America, in the United States, we were able to get a subsidy for low income people to help pay for their internet use. And that has brought more than 3 million older adults 
onto the internet at home just in the last year in the United States. So we're making some progress here, but it really requires a lot of different parts of the puzzle and a lot of grassroots advocacy and, and activism from people that are working in communities around the country. Thank you, Daniel. This is really interesting. So training, partnership, and confronting ageism. Are you seeing this? So, Mr. Kemmer, are you seeing, I, I, I'm, are you getting pings or asks for uh, interest outside of the United States for, for, the, for what you're doing? Because it's just amazing. We have been getting asks outside the United States, and, and we've I've certainly, I spoke at the, um, the first Asia, the Well Aging Conference in Japan, and was there um, in Tokyo and, and met with people from Meta, and there's a lot of activity in Japan already around technology uh, and digital engagement. They have um, economic development programs and service programs. I know Sampo uh, has the Sampo Digital Lab in the United States, which is here learning about, about strategies. In South America, I know in Colombia, there's a group called Per Computo, which is doing really good training on the grassroots level. And right side of, outside of Bogota, I visited a training program with senior citizens that was being held in a uh, a shipping container, and they had been reading our stuff at Senior Planet. And so when I got there, uh, we were able to, to talk in Spanish and they were able to share what they were le learning. I know there's programs in Brazil, uh, the International Longevity Center is running programs there. And uh, there's a, the international interest in this. We've done work in Israel. I was just on the phone with people from Jerusalem yesterday. And we did a partnership in Israel where they were able to use our curriculum at Oats and adapt it for the Israeli environment. Of course, Israel has very different um, cultural and demographic issues. Uh, they have the Haredim, the more uh, ultra-Orthodox that have different co concepts about aging. But I visited a, a center there where they have ultra-Orthodox women studying technology in Jerusalem, right next, next door to Jerusalem. And they're not using the internet, but they're using video and learning how to do video production so that they can have jobs doing videos for local parties and events and weddings and bar mitzvahs, which creates an economic development opportunity for those women who otherwise might not have it. And so there's really a groundswell around the world of places I've been working a little bit in, in uh, Spain as well. There's a lot of interest in using these new innovative approaches to bringing older adults online, but then also thinking about aging in that context and how to advance a more a well aging agenda. Can you can you talk about this? If I if I say there were a silver economy and the opportunities around aging, could you just speak to that? Because I just think I think a lot of the sub rosa discussion is, uh oh, this is a problem or this is going to be a, another a headache. I don't know. You know, I'm trying to like I think it's perceived as a problem. We have to reframe it as an opportunity. I think Japan has successfully moved sort of the way I think about the silver economy, the platinum economy. I think we're going to have to help folks shift the mind shift. Could you talk a little bit about how we should think about the economic opportunity in all this? Absolutely. You know, ARP has been really active on that particular issue around the silver economy, especially promoting opportunities for workforce engagement from older adults. So let's start with working. Um, many older people want to continue working well past the traditional age of, of retirement. And we believe there shouldn't be a rigid age of retirement for anybody. If you can still be productive at 60 or 70 or 80 or 90, why should you have to be pushed out of the workplace? So ARP has done a lot of studies of this and showed that people are able to continue being productive. It's better for their health. It's better for their social engagement. And they're contributing and paying taxes and contributing to economic activity in the countries. And in the United States, I know we have not been as act. We have, we're still learning how to promote and support that. We've come a long way in recent years. I know in other countries, they've been more active with it. And I've, I've, there's a lot else of other dynamics here. Um, there's a, a, a German um, architect named Matthias Holwick, who specializes in building age-friendly um, physical environments. And he pointed out, at a, he came to our center in, at Senior Planet in New York, and he pointed out that when you have investment in older adults in your community, it actually draws dollars into your environment. You can, um, older adults are, they have very extensive amounts of savings that they can be spending. They spend money on healthcare. They spend money on entertainment. They spend money on uh, local uh, services. And if you if you invest in a, in a healthy environment where older people are out and about and they're engaged aging and they're healthy and, and they're vibrant, it actually creates an, an economic multiplier effect. So we think that the silver economy is certainly part of the future. I'd also point out in Japan, 
Um, they're leading the way in, in robotics investment there. And I visited the Robotics uh, Institute at Tsukuba University when I was in Japan. And they're building really fascinating robotics uh, tools that are not meant to replace human services or human contact, but they're simply an opportunity to um, supplement or complement the work that a lot of caregivers are doing. And so there's an investment in building the technology around uh, aging. In fact, the Consumer Electronics Show, CES, which takes place in Las Vegas every year highlights a lot of those robotics technologies. And I've been a speaker at CES and there's really kind of an international, um, I'm not sure I would call it a partnership. It's almost a, a sub economy of providing resources and services and devices that are particularly relevant for older people and their caregivers. And I think there's a real economic opportunity here. Fabulous, thank you. Dr. Vega, thanks for being here. I welcome your comments. Oh, thank you very much for the opportunity, and uh, I'm very glad that the CIS and and uh, the rest of organizers and JICA and, and the rest of uh, um, rest of participant of the panel to be the, the opportunity for Pajo and for myself to be here. But uh, we are agree all that the aging is uh, is a reality for for Americas, and all the countries in Americas are aging. All are then, uh, all are aging uh, in the fast way. Uh, if we consider just one indicator, that is the aging index. Since uh, ten years ago, Latin America has more people over sixty than people less than five years old. And in the next eight years, and um, uh, for uh, around uh, 2030, the region will have uh, more people over sixty than people uh, less than 15. So I, I think that the, the, the proportion and, and, the, and the way that we are aging uh, may us seeing that uh, the, the, the challenge is today. This is, is, is tomorrow is, is, is too late to, to try to organize the, 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 the investment and the strategic approach that we will follow up in, in this issue. The other thing that I want to, uh, that, the, that our people consider is that uh, all the population is, is not the homogeneous group. It, it is a very diverse and uh, we all, uh, one of the ageist consideration around aging is, is try to put uh, all, all older people in the same, in the same bag. It's, it's like to consider the people between zero and 30, a same group. I mean, nobody considered that. So it's, it's not the same. Uh, we have a diverse group with diverse uh, condition, with diverse education, with diverse capacities. And uh, we need to com consider that in the way that we will invest in, in, the, in, the, in the process uh, and, and the manage of, uh, of, uh, these, uh, of this group. I, I think that, uh, and, and the COVID has been demonstrated that, that the other person has a very high capacity of adaptation. I, I read uh, some articles around ARP that uh, demonstrate that more and more the entrepreneurs, the people that are organizing the big enterprise consider the, the people, the older people as more confident in the moment of crisis because they are already live a life. They have a very high resilience and they can even adapt to the change. So the COVID demonstrate, of course, the, the COVID impacted, and especially in Americas, more in older people than in any other group. Uh, the mortality is uh, the higher mortality that we have in the older persons uh, and uh, has been a very uh, important issue. But the majority of the older population adapt very good to the, to the process and, and, and the resilience is, is, is very high. I think that this is a, a condition that we need to to consider and how the adaptation to the process has been very, very important for the older population in this moment. The third thing that I want to um, raise is, uh, is that it's clear now, the data uh, are clear about it, that the, the, the digital gap increased with age. Uh, there is, uh, of course, uh, a gap uh, among all the ages, but uh, increase uh, with age. But this is not because the older people cannot learn 
uh, and cannot uh, be uh, part of the of the process. And 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 my my previous uh, panelists the, has been demonstrated that uh, in, in very in very good way. Uh, but. If we want to change that, we need to try to change the way that digital market is approaching all the population. And, and this is a very important thing. I, I don't, I, I am not happy to say that the older population must adapt to the digital market. We need to understand that the G digital market must be adapted to the older population. And they uh, must work in that way. And they must consider that the way if we want to really uh, decrease the gap uh, uh, around digital approach in, in the older population. So I, I think that uh, many of these things has been demonstrated also. We, we published in the, in the WHO and the United Nations has published two or three articles very clear about how the discrimination by age, the age is, is part of the digital uh design in in many ways so one of the things that we need to understand and try to approach is how we could change the digital uh way to think around how today must uh answer into the digital uh, to the older person uh digital uh, needs uh, uh i think that the one of the things that can be uh helping that is the consideration about healthy age as you know, in the 2016, the WHO published uh, uh, um, the report, or, uh, the World Report of Aging and Health. And, and in, in this report, we uh, defined uh, healthy aging as a, as a, as a, 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 a new way. And in this new way, we are considering a, a healthy older person, the person that can make their functioning, they can functioning well. And when we think about what means functioning world, is that the person can do the things that uh, are important for them and they value more. So in, in this consideration, it's very important because the, 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 we are talking about the relation between two factors. One is the intrinsic capacity. It's about the capacities that the older person has to uh, approach the world, to approach the environment. But the second thing is how to we could make the environment more friendly to the older person needs, and and this is a it is very important because all the, what we are uh, we were talking uh, today around digital transformation are or could be a part of this uh, adaptation of the environment to be more friendly with uh, older population. In that sense, with the WHO. Uh, uh, start the movement uh, around the declare the 2020-2030 as a, as a decade of the healthy aging. We were having uh, a two uh, magnificent leadership with uh, Chile and Japan in this process. The, the two countries were the two uh, leaders of the process in the WHO, but also in the United Nations because our a member state in, in, in the World Health Organization decided that the, the decade of healthy aging must not be just uh, the, the decade for, 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 a, for a health sector, must be more wide. And, and they decide to bring the, the, pro, the proposal of the decade to healthy aging to the United Nations General Assembly. And the United Nations General Assembly uh, adopt the decade as, as a United Nations uh, decade. So, since the last year, we are working hard in in, in try to uh, approach this uh, decade of healthy aging and and must see as a as a big opportunity to work in the in the in the in in in, in, in transform aging as a, as a priority for for the majority of our member state. Uh, this is this uh, decade have uh, four strategic areas. One is we need to change the way that we feel, think, and act around aging and older population, and and that could be a, a definitive uh, remark that can can influence in the digital market. The second is that we need to transform the environment in the way that can uh, give the older population the opportunity to uh, live and age 
in the population in in the in, in the places where they they grow and 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 they live for for the majority of their life. The third one is that we need to transform our health system. We will need to transform our health service and redesign them in the way that can uh, respond correctly to the needs of older person. And the fourth one, and Pablo mentioned that, is how we could transform the long-term care system, how we could generate a long-term care system that can respond for, for the people that need long-term care because they are dependent of care, but also how we could transform the life of families that are usually the ones that are responsible for the care of this older person. So in, 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 in conclusion, I think that we, we, we have a, a decade of LCA already in place. That is a very great opportunity to transform the way that we think and act to the, to the aging and older population. And that could be a very good opportunity for the next 10 years. Dr. Vega, could you talk about how you've talked about we need to think of change our mindset but we also need to transform the environment so uh, and how folks age in place or where they grew up could you talk about the role of, of the technology role in all of this just because i think i know there's a significant role for technology in all this and how you're seeing that play out especially in the health space yeah that's uh that's uh that is uh, uh it's it's true and 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 uh you know, we have an initiative that we started in the 20, around 2010, that is the age-friendly cities and community. We started an initiative of, it was a very strong initiative that was very uh, catch it, but developed work. And uh, here in the Americas, we have uh, US and uh, we have a very strong partnership with AARP and Canada that, uh, you know, adopt the initiative as, as, uh, in a very strong way. I, I can tell you that the, around 2015, we have around 300 cities and communities in United States and Canada, and we have six in Latin America and the Caribbean. Now we have uh, around 100 communities of cities in Canada and United States, and we have almost 400 cities and communities in Latin America and the Caribbean. So in, in, in around six years, seven years, the, the, the movement grow a lot in, in Latin America and the Caribbean. And, and one great component of that is because we are working in the local in the local capacities to develop a local capacities to try to understand and approach in better way uh, how to uh, transform the environment uh, to uh, help the older person to live in, in a better way. And technology is one of the major focus that we have in the region. I mean, when we ask the communities and the cities uh, where they, they, they transform uh, or they are want to transform the reality of the environment, they choose technology all the way. And, and, and it's very important you understand that the, when we are doing the diagnosis, the diagnosis, diagnosis is, is need to be do it with all the population participation. So that means that when they recognize where they want to change, where, where they want to uh, see a, a transformation in the, in, the, in, the, in the environment that they are living, they mention technology all the time as one of the reasons that they, they want, or one of the focus that they want to be uh, a part of the transformation. So that I think that this is a, a very important part. And uh, I just final, finalize saying that during the COVID, we, we see that. I mean, we, we see both, both sides of the things. We, we, be, we, we, we saw it a lot of barriers. I mean, the COVID push for uh, digital solutions for many things. And, and we saw it, uh, unfortunately, the, the major uh, barriers that the older population have to, uh, to, 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 to get uh, opportunities to, to live in this transformation process. But at the same time, we, we see the, the capacity of the, of the older person to transform. I, I, I'm, I am seeing a lot of time how many older person are being part of uh, uh, training in, in Zoom, training in, in Teams. They are, they are, they are, they are be capable to, to, to learn in, in very fast way these technologies and, 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 and they are uh, 
adapting then in, in, in the very good way, even uh, with more than 80 years old. So could I, Emoto san could I bring you back into this? I'd love to get your reflections on what you've heard just now, because I think, um, I think we need to think about, we've heard about changing mindsets, we've heard about partnership, we've heard about technology, and we've heard about opportunity. I mean, these are all experiences Japan has had. It's also things JICA is thinking about. Would I would just be, I know you've thought about this, and I'd welcome any reactions you had to this panel, just because I think it would be useful, you know, to, to add to the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you for all very interesting comments and presentations. And um, there are several thoughts that came into my mind. And first, as, as, as uh, everybody mentioned, it's very important that uh, we should really change our mindset. I mean, aging is not something that to, to think about the, the end of the story. I mean, it's, it's actually opening up the new, new you know, the opportunities for all the society. You know, people have the hope to have live a higher, uh, happier life, and they create the new opportunities for new services and new technologies, and also the the older generations can also transform and adapt it to, to the new technologies. That really opens up the whole new opportunities. So we really need to change our mindset, seeing the the aging in the end of the story, but. To, to change this mindset, I think we really have to support uh, the, uh, the structural transformation and digital transformation. We need to have the various social spaces which support um, the trans, uh, transformation to, to pro keep providing services and to keep having the, the proper resources to, to support this transformation, right? So the finance structures like insurance, a lot of social services, we really need to restructure it around the, the, the population change. And as, as everybody mentioned, um, we really need to, to rescue people. I mean, around myself, a lot of older generations just do not really touch upon the new technologies. But uh, the new technologies are something this which is far easier to use in order in uh, now coming days. So we really have to encourage them to, to challenge the, uh, to learn the risk skill for the new technologies, new digital solutions and so on, that also we really have to support them to, to have the sound environment so that they can really risk themselves. So it's these communities, government, and a lot of, uh, um, private sectors and so on, everybody has to come around together and play their own roles. And of course, Japan has been trying many things, but it's not always a success. So we really need, we are like, uh, happy to uh, share our experiences. And so, so learning from others also, so that we can really see what, what works on the ground and what we need to really change or uh, re-change to, to adjusting to the, the, real, uh, the reality of the society. Right. Yeah, I, I, and uh, yeah. thank you, Emoto. that's amazing. I do think we're getting the multi stakeholders together, sharing of experiences, experimentation. These are all. I also heard the private sector. I'd love to hear from Dr. Ibaran and Dr. Vega and Mr. Camber about how should we think about the role of the private sector in all of this. And also, Emoto San, I'd love to get your thoughts about that. But let me bring them back in, and I'll come back to you. Uh, Dr. Ibaran, how, how should we think about what's the role of the private sector in, in, this, in this opportunity? Thank you very much. And I, I think the, this is a very important point because even though we're thinking about building long-term care systems, and I think a, a reality in Latin America is the, the informality. So in, in that sense, the, the insurance schemes that we know we've studied in Japan, in Korea, in Europe, are, are the basis is the contributions in most of the systems. Of course, we have exceptions like in Spain and, and, and in the UK. But given this reality, we know that the, the private, the public sector needs to play an important role 
in, in determining the financing and in shaping the market. But at the end of the day, it's going to be the private sector who will be providing the services. I think no one has a discussion of saying we want public provision of long-term care services. It is the private sector that needs to, to, to step, step up and identify this as an opportunity to promote business. And it, it is a very important opportunity also to, to create jobs directly and indirectly. And we see this in the, U, in the US, the, the Build Back Better initiative. I think the care economy was part of the infrastructure bill at some point, right? Because we know that this is essential in order to be able to create and to uh, and the economic and support the economic recovery so that's why we are partnering uh, for example with idb lab it's the innovation lab within the idb group in order to say okay how can we get the private sector the the, the innovators to think about solutions because long term care solutions be it some uh, residences be home care services that we know that that's going to be the bulk of the investment, most people want to age in place. It's the most efficient, the most, uh, in terms of welfare, that's the best solution, but it's gonna be the private sector. And we're having some experiences and challenges in developing the private sector. For example, in Uruguay, that has one of the first uh, national um, uh, care laws in the, in, in the region and a system in place. The challenge is how do we build small businesses that provide home care services and that's much more efficient when you have a small business than individuals, right? So, but I, I, we're convinced that we as um, supporting the, the public sector is to create the market, to shape it. But it is the dynamism of the private sector providers that we need, and we need to learn from experiences from all over the world, right? Uh, Bursac, I think it's an, an experience in, in, in Europe that's very interesting about a, like a, a cooperative of nurses that provide uh, primary health care geared towards all the population. So we, I really think the private sector needs to lead. We need to create the enabling environment to guarantee financing schemes that make it sustainable. But at the end of the day, this is an opportunity to, I insist, directly and indirectly create jobs. Something that's very interesting in Latin America is even though we, we're doing, we're having this very important um, demographic shift, when people in Latin America talk about care systems, they include older people, they include people with disabilities, and they include kids. And the common denominator here is supporting the labor force participation of women who provide 80 or 90 percent of the care. So I think this, this also kind of broadens the perspective, but I'm sure in, in any case, the private sector is key and we need to partner with them. We've been trying to bring experiences from the US, for example, uh, some of the big firms that provide home care services here, uh, visiting angels, homestead, then those to provide some insights and in, in, in how we can develop that in, in Latin America. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Camber, how about the role of the private sector in all this? I, 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 this is a really important question. I think um, there's a few different elements to the private sector's role. First of all, the private sector obviously is the engine of innovation in a lot of different uh, service designs for people. And as, as the previous speaker was mentioning, uh, for example, they're innovating a lot in, in home care services. They're in, innovating in technology services and, and devices and things like that. And so activating and encouraging the private sector to focus on these kinds of issues is really important. There are a lot of collaborations, though, where you can affect or, or sort of drive a little bit of change in the private sector. And we've seen government and nonprofit uh, partnerships actually help private sector partners do better. So for example, we were working with Capital One, which is one of the larger national banks in the United States, and they approached Oats because as a lot of the banking has gone online, a lot of older people are struggling to adopt those online banking skills. And the, But Capital One wants to retain those customers, even as they're trying to convert them into digital customers so that they have more tools and they're a little bit more efficient in the way they interact with the bank. Capital One approached us to help them build a video series and a training program to train older people to use their banking tools. And we were able to design a program together with a very large 
video production company that has now been visited by hundreds of thousands of Capital One customers, and it's open to anybody. It's called Ready, Set, Bank. And so it's an interesting collaboration there where a private sector, a large industry player is looking out to help their older customers do better with their financial security, but they're partnering with a nonprofit organization that has a social mission to help drive a better solution for people. We also work really closely with older people in those kinds of engagements. It's called co-design. I'm sure that most of the people on this session are familiar with the idea uh, around design thinking or orientations around building customer-centric models of product or service design. We've learned a lot from the private sector in adapting those tools, but organizations like ODES or like AARP are bringing a social impact orientation to applying those private sector tools and we're working them right up into partnerships so that we're able to achieve better outcomes. The other place to look for some of these changes is frankly in government regulation of the private sector. In the United States, for example, we're spending enormous amounts of resources on encouraging uh, investment for technology for older people around the country, whether it's broadband infrastructure or uh, supporting technology engagement in the healthcare industry. But the government is also uh, asking the private sector to, to step up and perform at a certain level. So applying universal engagement and accessibility for people as a condition of receiving resources is one of the things that our federal government in the United States has been doing lately. The recent uh, infrastructure package that was passed requires telecommunications companies that receive government money to create a low cost alternative for, uh, for their poorer customers, many of whom are older adults, so that people can get onto the internet who might not be able to afford it if it was just market driven. So there needs to be more of a collaboration between private sector and public entities and the nonprofits in order to achieve a better, healthier balance of, of innovation and also making sure that we're really engaging the more vulnerable populations here and protecting people's access and opportunities as well. Uh, if, if it's just left up to the private sector to do it without engagement with some of the regulation and some of the other kinds of partnerships, sometimes people really get left out and we're trying to avoid that. Dr. Vega? I totally agree with the comments. And, and I think that in, uh, in health, uh, we have a, a very important opportunities for, for, for cooperation with the private sector. And, and then I, I was thinking in the one of them would be very important in the, in the, in the self-care. I mean, uh, one of the major areas when technology are already investment, uh, are generating investment now is in the well-being and health. And, and, and I think that the, 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 the self-care, uh, especially in the world that uh, we, we have a lot of chronic disease now and, 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 and in the chronic management of, 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 uh, of uh, persons with, uh, with this uh, health problem has been transformed the way that we need to have a transform about the way that we will approach uh, uh, patients and, and, and persons. So uh, the self-care will be one of the process that we are uh, having to develop in, in the process. And I, I, we are have been doing the, a very strong partnership with uh, several university, with several companies uh, that are working in the private sector, try to introduce these uh, programs that can be a very strong influence uh, um, in the in the in the older person's uh, way to approach uh, health, uh, way to approach uh, uh, well-being. So I, I think that uh, it is a great opportunity. Within uh, I think that the the responsibility that the government and the public sector have to 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 as uh, I was mentioned before to try to uh, not only motivate the participation of the private sector, but at the same time, the same time uh, contribute with regulation and uh, with, uh, uh, with some control of this participation in the, in the, in, in the, in the product that the population receives. Emoto-san, I'd welcome any thoughts about the role of the private sector in all of this. Yes, um, as I, I mean, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, that Japan introduced uh, this long-term care insurance, and this insurance is mandatory. So that provided a certain amount of funding from private, you know, from ourselves and to the public. 
And then that means that the private entities can come into the market because it's quite clear there is the demand in this area. And in Japan, we have a, uh, many of these caregivers run by public entities, which are based in communities. So it's, many of these entities are not very big, but they are really based on the communities and have a, uh, um, a very good network among hospitals and public services and a lot of uh, other institutions so that they can have a holistic approach for in caregiving to, to the elderly. And they can provide a kind of, um, you know, not one, fit, one size fits all approach, but they try to, to address the individual needs. And this kind of thing, actually, it's very difficult for public sectors to do it. So public sector, they have their innovation, they have networks, they have, you know, they are more, you know, innovative in many ways. So it's really, really important that we have this kind of um, very active participation from private sector to, to catch the demand and the necessity of individual and they adapt, uh, adapt the services to that individual needs and demand. And also the new innovation in technologies, they also often talk with the local companies so that the companies can support technologically. I mean, that kind of also, you know, tries and the errors uh, going on on grassroots level that really helps to, to upgrade uh, the, the quality of services to the aging population. So it's absolutely necessity that we have public uh, and private partnership in this regard. Great, great. Okay, I've got a couple questions from the audience. One is from Hermes Flores. How can academic institutions help in the response to overcome the challenges of the aging population in the Americas? So that's one question I'd like this group to think about. But there's another question from Frank Kelly, who's a, an advisor here at CSIS. Is there a model out there globally, but I'd actually, let me reframe this. Is there, are there models regionally that you see as applicable for dealing with the challenges that we've discussed? in terms of partnerships, because what I'm hearing is we're going to need multi-stakeholder partnerships, civil society, the private sector, governments, there's a role for donors. So are there models out there? There have been some that have been mentioned. So I would say sure use the US, sure use Japan, but I'd encourage some thinking about are there models in the region that we need to sort of think about replicating because of the context. So at role of academic institutions in all of this, and multi-stakeholder partnerships or models, particularly regionally, okay, potential, as well as globally. And you can pick or choose, you can answer both, you can answer some, one or the other. But let me start with you, Dr. Ibaran. Thank you very much, uh, Dan. Um, so I think academics, I, I mean, we, we, we are the bank partner all the time with, with, with research institutions. And I think they do have the advantage of having like a, some uh, more laxitude in terms of the timing and, and in terms of, 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 of posing questions that are not like say pressing. And I, I, I do think that these issues, for example, I, I've been seeing more and more, of course, one of the areas that's very related to aging that we work a lot with in-house and outside with partnerships is the pensions, for example, something that in, the, in, in developed countries, this is something that's already solved in a sense. Uh, or, or much more advanced. Here, again, due largely to the 50% of the population working in the informal sector, that's a challenge. So I think that academia really needs to, 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 to pose the questions from this perspective, right? From a perspective that you have a population, uh, as, as Enrique mentioned, heterogeneous population that's working much longer, that wants to remain engaged. So what are the impacts of different policies to be, really help to contribute for this to take place? And in terms of models, I mean, I, I don't have a, a precise answer, but something that I've learned, that we've learned here is, I think if we look for national policies, national strategies, the region is really, really far behind, except, I mean, Uruguay, but there's, there are many local, and by local, I mean very, in, in a broad scale. I'm sure um, uh, Tom that mentioned, he has visited several countries. There are, important initiatives, maybe at the state level or even at the municipal level in Brazil, that's such a huge country. And I've seen in Colombia, I've seen in Mexico. So something that we need to learn is how to build, because we need to think of a system, 
but how to make or, or build on all the, the region, the local initiatives that we see by private sector, by philanthropies, even by public sector. For example, the, uh, the, the municipality of Bogota has an interesting uh, program of, care, of care, a care system. So I think we need to be, while still pushing for a broad solution, because this is a, a problem that needs or a challenge that needs a systemic approach, we need to really build upon those local initiatives. I've seen them in Argentina, in Peru. They innovated a lot as a response to COVID, for example. There was like a, 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 a grassroots movement to support uh, older people in Lima. So these are the type of experiences that we need to build on. I, I think that's that's my, my, my take on this. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Vega. Yeah, so I think that the academy has a very strong uh, responsibility in in this process, and uh, we we defined in the in the in the decay three three important three important enablers for 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 guarantee the accomplish of the decade that uh, all of them are are, are very basic and uh, or very have a very high responsibility in the academic work. One is is, is, is uh, what Pablo mentioned. We we need a better data. We need better answer. We need a better evidence to try to to develop uh, the, the 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 right initiative, the right answer uh, for the right question. And uh, the academic must have a, a very important uh, a, uh, uh, role in this in in this in this process. The second is is, is uh, the human resource preparation. I think that we we, we are we are very weak uh, today yet in the in the in how we prepare the the human resource to understand better the process of uh, uh, aging uh, as a demographic uh, challenge in the in the region. And and the third one is is, is generating a leadership. I think that the, 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 we, we need a better partnership with the academy than other uh, association to try to develop a right leadership that we need in the region to try to approach the, the, aging, the, the aging challenge. About the role, up, about the models, I, I, I'm, very, I'm very afraid about models and, and, and try to, to copy models. I, I think that the, you know, it's, it's very difficult to, to, to try to, to trans, Transplant a model from from one uh, system to the to the regions or, or, or areas that are different uh, conditions and, and situation. Uh, I think that uh, we, we we have been uh, uh, we we need to see several several models and that are becoming a good practice. But at, at the end, we need to to develop our own answer to to the, our own problems. In, 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 in some way. And uh, one of the things that I think that would be a very strong and good model is, is try to uh, uh, get resources to generate better, better um, uh, relation, better, be, better work, uh, transversal well, horizontal work in between the, uh, 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 our countries and our communities. And, uh, and not only uh, get the, the north south cooperation, but they try to uh, uh, potent, uh, make potential support to the south south cooperation in, in, in the final answer that uh, we need for our countries. Uh, Mr. Camber. Sure. There's three things that the uh, university based actors can do to advance this agenda. Uh, first of all, there's an engineering component to a lot of the work that we're talking about around the digital transformation with older adults. And so engineering schools have a, a kind of front row seat at the, uh, the aging trend where uh, they're able to both design products and services from an engineering standpoint in an age-friendly way. I think it was Pablo or maybe Enrique who mentioned earlier that we're um, we need to do co-design, we need to think about age-friendly design, about inclusive design, and there's an opportunity here for people to think about kind of the, the, the social impact engineering approach. The legal uh, profession in the United States has these 
um, you know, kind of public interest law uh, tracks that, that people that are going through law schools can do. And we've been encouraging the engineering schools here in the United States, certainly in New York, to think about a public interest track in engineering that focuses about doing engineering, but thinking about aging as part of one of the, the, the ways that, that people can be engineers for a public purpose. It's not just about the technology or about the devices. It's about what people do with them. So that's number one. Number two is, as a nonprofit organization, we are always challenged with the question of how do we hold ourselves accountable to making a difference? You know, we can go out and do a lot of work and we can say we're doing a great thing, but when it comes right down to it, how do you know, or how does a funder know, or how does somebody who's interested in our programs know that we're really who we say we are and that we're making the difference that we say we're making? And we've given, the best way to do that is nonprofit partnerships with universities. So we're working with Cornell University right now on a, on a research paper where they actually studied one of our programs. They used a control group of people and studied the comparison between the results from the people in our program and the people in a control group. And we will be publishing that this year. We published a study with them last year. And that allows people to understand that we're being accountable to making a difference. It helps us be smarter and it helps us uh, get more support for our programs. And then the last thing that universities can do is push government to act in a more uh, coherent way way and a more advanced way and be a little bit more agile at times in thinking about coming up with solutions for aging and technology in general. Government is an important actor, but in many cases, there's a kind of a an interchange or even sometimes a revolving door of the staff, the, the leaders in the university sectors often end up in government and then vice versa. And so having them shape government policy to be supportive of these kinds of initiatives is really important. And then the question about the models very quickly, I really agree that uh, with Pablo's point that the grassroots is the place to start. And if we're not activating people really in communities and the diversity that, that Enrique is re referring to, um, we really shouldn't be building uh, a big, like a, a concept of models without deep engagement with the, the activists that are making difference in very uh, you know specific uh, communities right now. The best model for, for kind of gathering those, those sources and helping make them into some kind of more engaged or policy uh, structure is probably our partner in Israel, which is Eshel. And it's an interesting model. I've learned a lot from Eshel. Uh, what they do is they go around the world gathering the best uh, ideas and models. Then they bring them to Israel and they, they try to incubate them internally to their nonprofit and philanthropic space. And then if they come up with a good way that works, they then try to get it supported by government and other institutions. So there's that need for an intermediary um, agency of some sort that can get the best ideas, nurture them, and then hand them off to somebody who can carry them out. And I think that kind of an approach does work. But again, it really is responsive to what uh, Dr. Vega was saying. We aren't, there's not one model that for how this should work. It's really about finding ideas and then really um, sort of uh, catalyzing engagement and innovation and helping support people in developing new approaches that are really relevant to their specific communities. Right. Um, Emoto san if you wanted to comment on those questions, that would be fine. I'd, I'd welcome if you have any reflections. Thank you. I totally agree with Mr. Uh, Dr. Camber, that we really have to, to find a local solution, a local idea, innovation, and I think it's very important we connect these local um, ideas and local innovation to maybe outside funding or outside technologies. And that's where uh, the, the agencies like JICA or donor agencies can play the role. And uh, when we had this new program with IDV Love and JICA that we tried, we tried to mobilize a Japanese startup to tackle the, the issues in Latin America, what was based was that the new uh, Japanese startups, they have technology and some ideas, but actually the best part was they could partner with local uh, communities and local uh, companies or local NGOs in Latin America who has a lot of ideas, but they didn't really have the uh, technologies or funding to, to realize their ideas. But then Japanese startups came, came in and they started to kind of co-create or co-shape the new, new solutions to the local needs. And that kind of connection is very, very important. So that, that's something that where we can really play, play the role. And um, also JICA has been engaged in South-South cooperation for quite long term. 
And it, it especially in Latin America, it really worked a great way that uh, when we supported some particular countries like Brazil or Mexico or Chile, and then the, those three countries can uh, support certain neighboring countries. And in terms of population aging now, JICA is working with Mexican partners and Chilean partners to, to tackle the issues arising from population aging. And I hope that these two countries will be able to support neighboring countries in the coming days with what they have, they have been doing with us so that, that they can localize uh, what JICA and these Mexican or Chilean partners are doing into their own context. And uh, so that uh, we would have the, we eventually we will create some, some kind of models, not the model, but models that might be able to be uh, localized in, in many ways in Latin America. Great. Okay, Pablo, let me come back to you, Dr. Ibaran. Let me, I've got a question, one other question I got from the audience I wanna capture before we end. What, why, with widespread informal employment in Latin America, how can we make sure that safety nets protect those who have not been involved in the formal economy? You referenced the large level of informality. How should we confront that, Dr. Ibaran? Thank you very much. I think we've seen a lot of work in terms of the non-contributory system. So the idea is you have people, uh, a sector that uh, contributes maybe to health or, 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 or unemployment insurance or some type of protection. And then we have a large sector, sector segment of the population who benefits from services that are provided or funded through general taxation. I think in all countries we see this mix, but in most, in some countries we see 90, 95% of the persons covered by the formal sector. And then a small group that cannot contribute or uh, th that receive the benefits informally. So what we need to do is to focus on at the same time that we increase the formal sector is to build a system that's not fragmented. We have a lot of experiences with health systems in Latin America that are fragmented in the sense that depending on how, what your situation in the labor market is, is the quality and type of health services that you receive. And we think that's not the way to go. The, 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 we need to focus in a way that everyone receives the same quality and increase that quality of services. And then you contribute or how you pay is a different question. That, for example, is something we see, and that can take different, different shapes, right? In Brazil, basically, it's a model where you have it like in the UK, where you have basically a, a, a tax-based uh, general revenue funding. And in Colombia, you have a system where you have contributory and non-contributory uh, uh, enrollment to the same system and people receive the same quality of services. So it's not, uh, I think uh, what, what uh, Mrs. Is, uh, Imoto was saying, it's not a, a having one model, it's to learn about different alternatives, but we need to be very mindful of when we build a long-term care system in Latin America, we will have different sources of funding, but we need to have one same um, standards, quality and service provision to everyone. Thanks. I think we should end it here. This has been phenomenal. I wanna thank my friends at JICA for their partnership. I wanna thank the panelists. This has been really interesting. Thank you so much for listening and both our live audience and then our, our folks who are gonna be watching this on, on recording. Thank you so much. This has been great. I'm, we're gonna end it here. Thanks, Thanks everybody.